afternoon. So, yeah, my name is Chris Jackson. I'm the Operations Director here at uh, Tikana Atea, the Space Institute at the University of Auckland. Um, and today I'm going to sort of provide an overview of MethaneSat and the operations that we'll be doing here. Um, first, I wanted to talk about the Space Institute. So, we're part of the Space Institute. The Space Institute's part of the University of Auckland. Um, so, we're working across a number of different areas. We're working, obviously, being part of the university at um, academic and, and research side. Um, we have both undergrad, postgrad, and um, say industry type short courses, um, and a lot of uh, say traditional academic research going on in, in various space uh, based um, disciplines. But we're also working on um, uh, actually building spacecraft, testing them, and operating them. So the full sort of life cycle of, uh, of development, if you like, end to end capability. Um, so we have the clean rooms in the the room opposite us here, um, where we're building the spacecraft. Down, down below, we have the, the, the test facilities, and here we have the, uh, the operations room, where we're actually able to operate the spacecraft once they're in orbit. So yeah, so just to, to, to sort of talk about that, we have uh, quite a large um, clean room next door, where we're able to, to build up the, the test, uh, build up the spacecraft. At the moment, we're building a couple of um, CubeSat satellites for launch um, early next year. Um, downstairs, we actually have a lot of large uh, test equipment, so the National Satellite Test Facility, um, where we're able to test the satellites before they launch. And these are tests that we have to do on satellites, everyone has to do on satellites um, to make sure that they'll survive both the launch environment and also the uh, in orbit uh, environment. So these facilities are available for other organisations around New Zealand to use. Um, they're quite expensive and, and not very easy to, to sort of come by, so this sort of helps us provide this. Um, National facility, if you like, um, and then uh, we have the operations control centre here today, which is what we're sort of talking more about today. Um, and this allows us, once we've launched our satellites, to actually operate them um, and control them in orbit. So um, we also have a ground station that we're working on down in Ardmore, around about uh, 20, 30 kilometres south of the city here in Auckland, um, and. This room will be upgraded at some point in the next six months or so uh, to allow us to have the increased security that we need for methane sat uh, while also keeping the, um, the sort of the open space or whatever that we need from a sort of openness and inclusiveness that we need within the university. Okay, so methane sat. Um, so as we just heard from Eric, methane is a, a, it's a highly potent greenhouse gas. Uh, contributes um, quite significantly to the um, man-made um, global warming um, and as Eric also said the if we can actually tackle methane it actually can be reversed if you like in a relatively short period of time so understanding um, the methane emissions allows us to tackle it so that's what methane sat is basically there for so a couple of years ago, MB, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment in New Zealand, uh, invested in MethaneSat. Uh, MethaneSat is a US-built spacecraft um, aimed at tracking methane emissions. It's uh, owned basically by the Environment, Environmental Defence Fund um, through a subsidiary called MethaneSat LLC. And they aim to reduce methane emissions from oil and gas um, by about 40% in the first year or two after launch. So as part of this investment, uh, MB uh, has funded us to do the, the mission operations, uh, also um, Rocket Lab, and also uh, again within that operations infrastructure, and also they've funded a space, uh, sorry, science program um, aimed at using the methane sat data to accurately measure the agricultural sources of, of methane emissions. So, as I said, methane sat was primarily put up to look at the oil and gas industry, but the um, agricultural emissions actually form a very large percentage of, of global methane emissions. So this is being managed by um, NEWA down in Arlington. Okay, so yeah, methane sat um, sits in the middle, as, as Eric just sort of said, of the sort of the high resolution and, and global um, sort of scale sensors. Um, it, is aimed at providing um, precise, reasonably wide view, um, but also targeted in at, at certain um, methane sources. So 
it, it provides a 200 kilometer swath and a roughly 100 kilometer by, uh, sorry 100 meter by 400 meter um, pixel. Um, it will fly in a, around about a 500 kilometer orbit uh, in order to achieve this, uh, this data. So it's a roughly, I'll say, fridge-sized spacecraft. We always like to um, draw some parallel to something. So it's a fridge-sized spacecraft, 1.6 meters by 1.4 meters by 1.1 meters, and around about sort of 350, 400 kilograms. Uh, it's three-axis stabilized, which means we can basically point it wherever we want to, so we don't have to image directly below the, the satellite. We can um, steer off to the side. Uh, and it has two uh, state-of-the-art imaging spectrometers, one looking at the, um, the methane band, or the methane, uh, yeah, methane band, and one looking at, at oxygen. Um, and currently it's looking at observing around about 30 image targets per day, each target being scanned for around about 30 seconds, giving us a 200 kilometer um, along track um, scan. So the spacecraft itself, along with remote spacecraft, you know, built up of say two primary parts. We have the um, the platform, which provides all of the likes of um, the spacecraft communications, onboard computers, uh, propulsion systems, and communications. And we have the the payload, which is obviously the the part that we really need, if you like. So in the case of methane sat, it's, it's the, the spectrometers that are that are looking at um, actually sensing the methane data. Um, so methane sat has the the spacecraft bus up the top here in this case, which is produced by a company called Blue Canyon in the United States. Um, and then below that we have the, the payload with the, the two spectrometers. Um, and then the majority of the rest of this wrapped around here is to try and control its thermal environment. Um, we have a payload electronics unit, um, but then, as I say, we have the radiators to try and keep the sensors um, on the focal plane cool, and we have the housing, if you like, and the, the, the heat shield um, to try and keep the sun off the, uh, off the sensors and keep the, uh, uh, the sensors nice and cool. We also have uh, two communication antennas down on the earth-facing facet, um, an S-band antenna, which we use for communicating um, or controlling the satellite, so all of our operations when we want to, to schedule up images or um, command the satellite to, to do a propulsion burn to maybe avoid some collision with space, uh, with space debris or something like that uh, is done via the S-band system and then we have the X-band antenna which is the high rate downlink for, for downloading all of the, uh, the, the, the methane uh, image data. So yes, yeah, just a few images of the, the satellite coming together. <coughs> These are uh, at, Blue, at uh, Bull Aerospace in, in Colorado where they're doing the spacecraft integration. So. Blue Canyon have delivered the, the, the platform uh, to Bull, and Bull are currently or have integrated the, uh, the spectrometers onto the um, onto the platform. So we here see the the, the two spectrometers um, on the top here, um, and the the, the, the the payload sorry the platform if you like down the bottom. And another couple of sort of more integrated. You can see the uh, the heat shield uh, over on the left hand side here, and, and it's kind of shrouded a little bit. Try and keep heat as it as the satellite rolls um, to sort of point off nadir. We want to keep uh, radiation both from the sun and from the earth off the the um, off the radiators uh, to again keep it nice and cool. So we can see the earth facing facet up here with the, the various antennas, so the X band antenna, the S band antenna out on its. Uh, um, raised stalk or whatever. Um, and we also see here the solar array hold down mechanisms or hold down attachment points. Um, so the solar arrays were put on each side of this um, and uh, held down for launch. And then we have the solar array drive mechanism at the bottom here, which will steer it once it's in orbit. So methane set will go into a um, what's called a sun-synchronous orbit um, and Basically, what this means is that the satellite um, will always see fundamentally the same time at the Earth that's below. So, in this case here, it'll be sort of 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So, whenever the satellite's flying over land uh, or over the Earth, it will always be around about 11 o'clock or 10, 10, 30 to 11 o'clock on, on the Earth below it. 
Um, and this is quite important because we, uh, especially from an earth imaging perspective, because we have uh, constant um, lighting and that's really important to allow us to, to um, compare different images over, well, over different locations or at different times of the year. So the satellite will operate um, in around about sort of 525 kilometer altitude. Um, that's low enough that we have to perform regular uh, pulsion burns to, to keep it at that altitude so the Earth's atmosphere doesn't uh, slowly bring it down and we have a five year um, operational lifetime. It's scheduled to launch on Transporter 10 mission uh, in no earlier than February 1st next year, um, depending on exactly when um, SpaceX get their full manifest together. And we'll have 20 to 30 contacts per day um, using a ground station network from an organization called KSAT, um, which is a Nor Norwegian company um, that have a, a network of ground stations around the world. And their main ground station is in a place called Svalbard, which is uh, right at the top um, near the North Pole, 82 degrees north, I think it is. Um, and they have a whole load of ground station antennas that we can see here. And the nice thing about this location is that in a sun synchronous or in a polar orbit, which a sun synchronous orbit is, the satellite flies roughly over the pole, over the north and south pole every 100 minutes, which means a ground station that's located near the poles will receive a very large number of ground contacts per day. So that's really good for us to put so one ground station there and get lots and lots of ground contacts. Um, so as I say, you know, we will use the S-band system for command and telemetry, getting the, the health data back from the spacecraft, and the X-band system is 100 mega, 150 megabit downlink, um, giving us sort of upward of 200 gigabytes per day. Um, we have a multinational team uh, working on the spacecraft, or working on the operations at least. So we have um, mission operations being performed initially um, by Paul Aerospace in, in Boulder. They'll do the, the initial commissioning of the spacecraft. Um, the next few months of commissioning, up to maybe six months or so, will be performed down in Rocket Lab in um, Mount Wellington here in Auckland. And then the University of Auckland here in this room will actually operate it for the next five years or so. In order to facilitate that, everything is actually located in the cloud, and this is a little bit different than most spacecraft. Most people are more worried about, um, I say security, not to say that we don't have security concerns, because we definitely do, but that's all being managed in to make it um, nice and easy for us to operate across these uh, international borders. So it'll all be operating in the Google Cloud, and we'll actually only connect to the, um, to the spacecraft control system uh, using a, a web browser. So methanesat, as I said, is primarily looking at oil and gas, which is what we see down here in, in the, the, the map on the, the right here in red. So that's the targets that are currently identified. But there's also a lot of, um, say, the green targets, which are, are the agricultural targets, and clearly a lot of those down here in New Zealand, um, and also some wetland targets. So these are the main, the main targets that are currently being identified, um, and we'll be basically scheduling those the, the operations up from here um, over the five years in order to sort of monitor what uh, methane emissions are coming out um, around the world. So in order to test all of this out, um, Methane Sat LLC is running currently running a campaign using an airborne based system, effectively the same payload as is going to be flying on the spacecraft, um, and that's running on an aircraft out of the United States at the moment. So. They'll actually use this um, to verify the performance of the payload, to verify the um, data processing system on the ground, so that once methane set is launched and the, the data is coming down, you know, the huge amounts of data are coming down off the satellite, they know that the, the data processing chain on the ground is actually working and producing data products rather than having to spend six months uh, debugging that. And the other important thing is it allows them to, to, to cross, cross correlate and, and calibrate. Um, the data that's being received from the spacecraft um, with ground-based measurements and also ground, I say ground truth, they've got, uh, they have done a few um, controlled releases of methane to allow them to, to calibrate um, the sensors. So this, um, you always or nearly always need some way of, of measuring what you're um, measuring on the ground, what you're measuring from space and then doing some sort of cross-correlation. So that, that this, um, uh, 
operation or this mission is actually operating at the moment. They've, they've uh, I think, bought this aircraft now. Initially, it was run for a couple of months. They, they hired one. Now they've got one. They're running it um, a lot more over the United States. And this shows some of the data they got down, I think, just a few weeks ago. Um, so interesting thing here, the, the blue area that you can see, this is the, the methane data that they've acquired. Um, so they flew backwards and forwards over, um, say, northeast, northwest uh, Texas for two hours. Um, getting all this data. Um, the red area is what we'll actually get in seven seconds or so on methane chat. So um, you can see the utility of, of the satellite versus the airborne system. Um, yeah, but you can sort of see here, um, obviously we have you know, different colors showing the different um, amounts of methane that they've received or seen. Um, obviously some dark blue areas up here in the, the top left, not too much methane. And then we can see uh, methane plumes blown by the wind or point sources down here that are, are very, very, uh, very bright. So that goes into their uh, processing system and actually comes up with these, these sources. And the idea then is to actually go there on the ground or maybe not go there on the ground because it's probably in some sort of facility that's uh, restricted. But to be able to say to these companies that operate these facilities, oh, you've got a, a methane leak. And actually hold them to account by you know, showing these data. Um, but they can also look at, uh, say, methane over a wider area, so these area sources here. And I think the interesting thing that was said about this is that when they add up all these point sources, um, it adds up to a lot less, or the area adds up to a lot more methane than is actually coming out of the point sources. So it shows as a background, um, say, emission of, of methane coming from other sources, agricultural sources, or, or, or just slow releases from other pipelines or whatever. The other interesting thing here is um, because this took so long, say a few hours to, to gather all this data, they've actually factored in the fact that some of the methane they've measured during their, um, during their flights has actually been blown in from other areas outside of the, the area that they're targeting. And of course with methane set, that won't be an issue because this whole lot will be gathered within a few seconds. So I know a common question I get is, you know, why are we doing this at the university? Um, you know, why isn't the satellite being operated by Rocket Lab or, or whatever? But um, you know, we will operate the satellite once it's commissioned. And um, this mission operations center here, as I said, will be upgraded to allow us to support both the university class missions that we're doing at the moment, like we're building over here in the clean room, um, but also sort of government or commercial requirements as well. Um, and the idea here is to allow us to have a, a, a mission operations center that is capable of providing operation support for other research missions within New Zealand. But again, we're a university. One of the aims, and one of the aims from MB as well, um, with giving us this funding, uh, is to get students involved with, with methane sat and students involved with the operations. Um, we'll have undergraduates invited to come in here and actually participate in the operations of the spacecraft. Um, and they'll be obviously um, sort of guided or monitored or whatever by our certified operators. But we'll also have internships available um, for a smaller number of um, post or, or or undergrad or postgraduates probably, um, that we will actually train up and certify to operate the satellite for some of the, I'll say, more routine operations at least. Um, and the ultimate goal there is really to try and fuel or, or you know, spur along the New Zealand space industry, getting engineers interested in operations or interested in space, operating a real life space mission before they go out there into industry and work for companies like Rocket Lab or Dawn or the various other, many other companies out there in New Zealand that are getting involved with space. So yeah, so MethaneSat uh, should be launched hopefully in about nine months time um, and hopefully will allow us to characterise and ultimately reduce methane emissions. Um, we'll provide the operations here um, once the spacecraft is commissioned, so probably late next year we should be handing over or should be have the operations handed over to us from, from Rocket Lab. Um, and ultimately the, the investment here from, uh, from MB is to build this operational facility. Um, you know, mission operations is a, quite a high profile thing. It allows us to hopefully build up the interest within the university, within students, and ultimately um, 
spur on the uh, New Zealand space industry. Thanks so much, Chris. Okay.